To create a WebSocket request in Postman, don't click on a new tab because that will not help you a lot. Rather, locate the new button and under building blocks, you should be able to find WebSocket request. After clicking on that, you will be able to enter the URL of the WebSocket. I will use the WebSocket from websocket.org that will simply send back some messages. So the protocol is WSS, which stands for WebSocket Secure, pretty similar to HTTPS for HTTP, column slash slash, and the address is echo.websocket.org. To establish the connection, I will click here on connect. As you will see here on the lower part of the screen, now the connection has been established and I can start writing messages. I'll type in a very simple hello world message and click on the send button. In the lower part of the screen, with an arrow pointing up, you'll be able to see the messages you have sent and with an arrow pointing down, the messages you have received. Unfortunately, you cannot save this request to a Postman collection, but we will talk about the limitations of this feature in Postman toward the end of the video. However, this example is not a very good example for explaining what WebSockets are. Let's dive in a bit deeper. Historically speaking, Postman has been used as an HTTP client. It did not matter if you were working with REST APIs, SOAP web services, or more recently, GraphQL. All these API architectural styles, if you can call them like that, had something in common, HTTP. This protocol is not only widely used on the web, but also most APIs use it. With HTTP, to get some data, you need to send a request. After this exchange, the connection is closed. If you need additional data, you need to submit another request. So HTTP helps create synchronous APIs. Async APIs solve a different need. The communication is no longer following a pattern of sending a request and receiving a response. For example, if you want to receive messages from a chat or the current stock price for a company, what you need is a live feed of data without you having to ask for new data every second or so. The data comes when the server sends it. This is what async APIs are good for. WebSocket is a communication protocol, just like HTTP is, that allows asynchronous communication. Unlike HTTP, with WebSocket we open a communication channel in the beginning and don't close it unless we wish to stop the communication altogether. That communication channel will be used for exchanging messages. Technically speaking, this is what we refer to as full duplex communication, as all parties can communicate with each other at the same time, just like two persons in a phone call. But let's take a look at another example to better understand how the WebSocket protocol works. I'm here at bitstamp.net and this is a cryptocurrency exchange. And for example, if I'm looking here into the Bitcoin price, I will see that the data that is on this page is constantly changing. It's a feed of data based on the transactions that happen actually in real time. And luckily, Bitstamp also offers a WebSocket API. Just as with any other API, to use a WebSocket API, you first have to study and understand the documentation. One of the first starting points is to understand where you need to make the connection to, and you will see here that the server is accessible under this address. So let's go ahead and copy this and add it to Postman. In Postman, remember not to open a new tab, but to click on new, WebSocket request, and here you can paste the URL. I'll also remove this dot and click on connect. Now you will see here that a connection has been established, but in order to start interacting with this API, we need to understand how we can compose messages. If I simply write here something like hello world, you will see here that what's coming back is a response that is telling us that 
this is now JSON. This is an incorrect format. So first of all, we need to send something that is in JSON. And even if we're sending JSON, this API cannot understand what we actually want. So for that reason, we have to go back to the documentation and try to understand how we can submit a message that has some meaning for this API. Now, here comes the concept of subscription. This API has lots of data, many cryptocurrencies that are being exchanged in real time. And we can subscribe to a specific event. For example, we can be interested only in the live trades that affect Bitcoin to USD transaction. So this is the JSON structure that we need to have. And I'm going to replace that in Postman. So we're going to subscribe and we're going to subscribe to a channel called live trades, live underscore trades. And we're interested in BTC, that is Bitcoin to USD. You will see here in the response that this subscription is now successful, which means that the API knows we are interested in this data. And without us doing anything else, we are getting these messages essentially regarding the trades that have been happening. So the price, the order ID, and so on. It's not really interesting from us from this internal point of view, like what does this data mean? but more from a functionality point of view. If you wish, you can also use the search because once you have quite a few messages here, it will be harder to go through them. And if you're looking for something particular, using the search will be quite useful. You also have filters like which will only show you the messages you have sent or the messages you have received. And of course, if at one point in time there are too many messages, you can simply clear them. There's also this checkbox that you can click here. And if you select one message and one message from the beginning or from whichever point you wish, you will see the time difference between them. So in this case, the time difference since we have connected and until we got that respective message has been two minutes and 46 seconds. Not sure if this is particularly useful, but it's something that has been built in Postman right now. Now, let's end this video by talking about some of the limitations I have noticed. At the time of this recording, this feature is relatively new in Postman and still experimental. You can notice here the beta. While you can use Postman to make WebSocket requests and you can put variables in the address or even in the payload, there are still some limitations. As I mentioned in the beginning, most annoyingly is that you cannot save a WebSocket request to a collection, so you cannot easily renew that. Still, if you visit your history, you'll be able to find the connections that you have made in the past and you reuse them from there. It's not ideal, but it's, at least you don't have to start really from scratch. If you're looking in the Postman console, you will see that the traffic is not really locked. So all these WebSocket messages that are going out and going in, they are not available in the Postman console. In the beginning, you will see this HTTP messages being sent. And this is part of the WebSocket specification. In order to establish a connection, you first need to send some HTTP messages. This is something that Postman does automatically for you, so you don't have to worry about that. And this is why this switching protocols appears here in the log. But other than that, the actual WebSocket messages, they are not being displayed here. Another annoying thing is that because the Postman console does not log this, if, for example, you disconnect, either if you do it manually or the server drops the connection or you have been inactive for a period of time, if you go back and click on connect again, you will see that all previous messages are gone. So this is something you need to keep in mind just in case you need those messages. It will be hard to look into what has happened before you disconnect it. In terms of data that you can send, of course, you can send text, JSON, XML, anything else, but also array buffer. I'm still struggling a bit with this. I tried sending some files, but it's not like when you're sending a blob with the usual Postman request where you can just select a file. So this is something that I think it's like very, very raw and not so useful for some people. 
So if you need to send files or binary files generally, that may be kind of a limitation, I would say. In terms of testing, you can only do manual testing. There is no scripting or API testing support for WebSockets right now. And don't get me wrong, all these limitations are understandable and I'm sure that they will be addressed over time. Mainly, automatic testing totally takes another dimension when dealing with WebSockets because as you have seen, there are so many messages coming in and going out. So it goes beyond this traditional pattern we have seen with HTTP where you have a message going out and a message coming back. So that was very, very predictable. WebSockets are unpredictable and also writing tests for that, it's not really easy. Still, I hope this was useful and has helped you better understand what WebSockets are and how they work in Postman. If you want to support me to make more videos like this one, like and subscribe. Don't forget to leave a comment in the section below and I will see you next time.